Saints, let's bar our hearts. Father, we come before you this evening with anticipation, Lord. So often, Lord, we have all been through battles in one form or another, and yet your word is such an amazing teacher, Lord. Teaches us, Lord, your heart. Um, as we go through this world, there will be tribulation. And there's going to be trials. There's going to be those things. And yet, Lord, we can keep our eyes on you. We can look to your word. And through that, Father, we can have victory. And so, Father, we look forward to just you impressing upon our hearts, Lord, a greater understanding of your heart. That we would know your son more and more as we get to know him. We would fall more in love with him. And so, Father, show us. Show us the love of God as we look through this word, as we look through, um, Father, your heart revealed. So speak to us. Simply give us ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us, your church. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, Amen. 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 Saints, Genesis chapter 14. If you want a header for this chapter, just jot this down. Four battles. What we're going to be looking at tonight is four battles through this chapter. And it's interesting, as we go through these battles, we're going to see how the, the different battles, um, how, how do we approach battles? And, and so sometimes in this world, there are just things that they realize. In this world, we are going to have tribulations. There are going to be trials. And so there's battles that we all face in one form or another. And I think a, a good plumb line is this, to put our heart and, and line it up with the Word of God. Have you ever seen those transparent things? where, where you, you actually have something underneath it and you lay something on top of it and then you see just how it lines up. That's what the Word of God does to our own hearts. And that's what it's going to do tonight. When you take a look at when you have these battles and you say, well, how do I approach battles? How do I fight battles? You're going to find, do I fight battles like the world? Do I fight battles in faith? Do I fight battles through, through literally just clinging to Christ and his promises and just, just drawing to him? And then how do we fight our battles? So what we're going to be looking at tonight is basically this, four battles. Let's look at the first battle here as we go into chapter one. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elasser, Chedalaamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of the nations. They made war. So you have these four kings that are, are about to make war with these five kings. These um, four kings are going to be um, off to the area of where, um, closer to Persia. And as they make their way up, we're going to see here, they're going to be making war with five kings. So we have these four kings. The, the, the head guy that we're going to see as we go through it, Chedalaamar, we'll be looking at him a little bit more. But verse 2 says this, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, um, Shemeber, king of Zoibim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. And all these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they, those five kings, served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and his kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, Emin in Shava, um, Kirithaim, and the Horites in the mountain of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And then they turned back and they came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Malachites and also the Amorites who dwell in Hazon Tamar. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and joined together in the in battle in the valley of Siddim against Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, Tidal, the king of nations, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Arioch, the king of Eleazar, four kings against five. Verse 10, now the valley of Siddim was, four of, was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. Verse 12 said this, They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. 
So what we see here is in this first battle, won't go over all the names again, but we see the four kings battling the five kings. And in the direction that we're talking about, what they did is this. They begin to battle um, the, um, almost to the point of, of being in northern Israel, Lebanon. And they literally took these nations all the way down almost to the Red Sea. So they, they did this amazing swath of land that these five kings came and said, hey, we're going to just make you guys behave right now. We're not messing around. And so they came and they said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna simply subdue you. And that's so often what the world does. The world doesn't give you a choice. The world says, hey, I'm going to subdue you one way or another by hook or crook. Now, it's interesting that I think this is a unique point that we see this. In verse 12, it says this, that, that for 12 years they served Chedorlaomer. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. I want to read you a proverb. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, it just simply says this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Now, it's interesting. These kings, these five kings, are rebelling against the one king. And he brings these four other kings. And so often, kings think this. I'm in charge I'm the one who's making the decisions, and I'm going to do this. And what's interesting is that God's hand is in it all. There, there, there's nothing that God's hand isn't doing through the situation. And I think when you realize that here, God turns the king's heart, he turns the king's mind wherever he wishes, these kings think they're in charge. And the bottom line, they're not. God is the one who's doing the work. And I think it's so important that when you realize what nations are doing and how nations are changing, Keep in mind that God is sovereign in these things. Um, it's been so said a lot that God gives a nation the leadership that they deserve. And so keep in mind that it may not be just you independently, but it's a nation. And so there are times that God says, listen, this is where you're at. These are the leadership that I will give you. Now, what we're seeing is this. As these kings begin to rebel, something unique that we look at within the, this battle, it declares this. In verse 10, it says this, The valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountain. So we see this, that as these, these four kings were battling these five kings, that they had this crazy idea that what they were going to do is they were going to start this war, or they were going to meet up in the valley of Siddim. Now, uniquely within this passage in verse 10, it says this, that the valley was full of asphalt pits. If you've ever been to like up in, in the Southern California, a little bit northern, they have the La Brea tar pits. And it's interesting that what happens is this, they had a bunch of asphalt pits. They had tar pits that were there. And what these five kings were thinking is, hey, if we battle here, I can use something to my advantage. And so they, what happens is this, that when you have these tar pits, the wind would blow and the wind would blow and then the sand would blow over those tar pits and it would almost be like quicksand. You wouldn't know what's happening. You wouldn't know what's underneath. And these five kings think, oh my goodness, we got the advantage here. We're going to be here and we're going to just allow them all to fall into the tar pits and we won't even hardly have to battle. We're going to use all these worldly things to our advantage. The crazy thing is this, although they went to battle in that area of the, 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 the tar, asphalt pits, it says in verse 10, now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits and the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah fled. Some fell there and the remainder fled to the mountain. As they were running, they fell into their own pits. And they said, this is going to help us out. And the bottom line is exactly what we think will help us out. What? hinders us in some way. And I think the scripture where the world trusts in horses and chariots, and we as Christians, we don't. And I think it's so important to look to the world and how the world battles. And you, you have this thing where they think, you know what, it's time for me to rebel. Keep in mind that God was the one who put on these hearts to rebel. God was also the one who put on Chedorlaomer and the four, four kings to come. So you see here the powerhouse of what's going on. Four kings battling five kings. The four kings win. And it makes this statement that is so unique. Verse 11, they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their possessions and they went their way. 
basically everything they had, everything that was there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now remember when we were back in chapter 13, that when Lot was looking at a place to go and Abram said, Lot, you choose where you want to go. That we saw this in chapter 13, verse 10. Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that was well watered. Everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zor. But then it said in verse 13, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So we realize that this is Sodom and Gomorrah. God is putting upon their hearts, we're just going to rebel. We're not going to serve these kings. And so God is using that old mindset to say, I'm going to try to discipline you. I'm going to try to get you out of this place where you're at. And so he allows these five kings to be conquered by the four kings. But then they made a mistake. Verse 12 says this, they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So what we see is this, Lot now went to camp by Sodom. Now it says that he's in Sodom. Eventually we're going to see that he's one of the, the leadership in Sodom. But what we see here is this, that as he's in Sodom, he's now caught up with what? What God is doing to that country, what God is doing to that city, what God is doing to that area. And so often as Christians, when we find ourselves compromised, as Lot find himself compromised, we find what? That we get washed up and, and washed away with what's happening in the world. Rather than setting yourself apart, when God deals with these areas of Sodom, Lot is now caught up on it. And so Lot is now taken. Lot is everything that he has is gone. And if you want a reference here, it's just a beautiful thing. If you're familiar with Psalm 1, and, and just a, a beautiful psalm it is. But I just want to read to you the first verse of Psalm 1. You go to the, the, the psalms, you open it up. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who stands not in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. See, you're a blessed man when you're not hanging out with, with those that are really in opposition to the Lord and that are, are wicked and sinful, as it said you know, back in chapter 13, verse 13. And so we see here that, that Lot was there in the midst of that sinful place. And because he was there, when God was trying to deal with them and get their attention, Lot was caught up as well. It makes this statement now in verse 13. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the tabernacles trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, the brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now at this point, I want you to realize that here one man escapes. So one guy comes and whether he was someone that Lot sent or someone who just said, hey, I, I know of Abram, you know, maybe he could help. But it's interesting that what he's going to find out is that Lot is gone. And so Abram finds out that his nephew has been taken. Now that brings Abram to do what? I'm going to go get my nephew. Now, this turns out to be the second battle. Now, what we're finding out is this, that the first battle is the world against the world. And the world is always going to try to find things to use to their advantage. But keep in mind that God simply guides the hearts of the kings. He guides their minds. He guides their hearts wherever he wants. God's in control of all the nations. But now when it comes to the battle of Abram, Abram now hears about his, his nephew Lot. Lot, as we talked about last week, as we look to, you know, how Peter described him as righteous Lot, over and over, righteous Lot, his righteous soul was tormented day and night. And so we realize that he's righteous. However, what we're going to find out is this, that when we actually look in the scriptures, I literally spent months, this is no joke, I'm not trying to exaggerate, I spent months praying and saying, Lord, where in the world is this guy righteous? I've been looking and looking and looking. And I literally, I, I was like, I can't find anything. I can't find anything. God said, you haven't, you haven't looked to me yet. Look to me. Look at what I'm saying. There was one thing that I actually found that I could say, wow, Lot, this was righteous. His daughters were virgins. In Sodom and Gomorrah, they were, of course, he was going to give them over to a bunch of guys, but he, they were virgins. And like, that was something he did, something that he had that was right, his own home. Although the rest of his life and everything was kind of crazy, and he compromised things crazy because he was carnal. Now, at this point, what Abram has is he has a 
he calls, well, he will call Lot his brother, but it's his brother's son. But understand, it's his brother. And as a Christian, we use that term as well. We use our brother and our sister in Christ. We're the family of God. Now, it's interesting that here, Abram has a brother that is carnal, a brother that we're going to find out is, is even more carnal and gets more carnal. And his brother is caught up in something now. And, and it's something that whether he, he didn't choose to, but he's now caught up in this battle. He's caught up in this warfare. He's caught up in the ways of the world. And as he's caught up now, what Abram does is this. Abram is going to, by faith, seek to what? Go and restore his carnal brother. Mm. And this is a second battle. And keep in mind that this is sometimes a battle that we all have to face. If you've known a brother or a sister in the Lord that's kind of caught up in some things, is acting carnally, then, then we're going to get some great wisdom. And how do you approach that? How do you go about that? And what, what Abram does is this. When he hears the word, and I want you to, to realize, and don't make a mistake, that when we come to verse 13, it does declare this. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the tavern trees of Mamre, the Amorite. So there's a guy here who is has some land, has tavern trees, and Abram is there by the tavern trees of Mamre. This Mamre, as we're going to find out here at the end of verse 13, is what? They were allies with Abram. There is a man by the name of Mamre. He's the Amorite. He's the brother of Eshkol. He's the second guy and the brother of Aner. So you have these three brothers that are hanging out with Abram. Now, the interesting thing is this, that these are Abram's allies. They're friends of his. And what's interesting is this, as he goes to battle, these three men are going to join him. And I think, you know what? Isn't that really the way to restore a brother who's fallen? If your brother's overtaken in a trespass, so what do you do? Well, you go to your brother and you tell him his fall between you and him alone. But if he doesn't hear you, what? You go and get another brother and then you go and you approach that brother. And then if he hears them, praise the Lord, you've restored your brother. And then if he doesn't hear them, well, then you tell it to the church. And I think it's so important that it's about literally where two or more are gathered. There's the Lord in the midst. Yeah. And I think it's important. It's almost as if here's Abram. He has these guys that are now bonding with him to do what? To go and to restore his brother who's fallen. And, and I think it's so important that, that when you have a, a brother that's fallen, keep in mind that I'm going to warn you of this. There's this thin, thin line because so often when someone has fallen, that someone would come up and say, listen, Pastor Lowell, you need to really pray for this brother because he's, and it's gossip. It's not a heart to restore, it's just gossip. He just can't wait to tell someone. And I'll tell you what, don't tell anybody. Go before the Lord and say, hey, you know what? Why don't you come and pray with me for this person? Why? God knows, God knows. Keep in mind, there's a great, great line that says this. It's not my story to tell. And sometimes that's a great thing. It's not for you to tell. It's not for me to tell. It's not my story to tell. But I'll tell you what. God's put upon my heart to pray for this person. Can you come? Can you pray? Can you join me in prayer? And Abram now has these three men that are there. Now, I'm going to have you jump real quick to verse 24 of this, this chapter because I want you to realize that these men were with Abram. In verse 24, after Abram... We'll, we'll tell the, the, the king of Sodom, I don't need anything that you have. It does say this in verse 24, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. It's interesting that what Abram does is to his three friends, his allies, he says, you know what? I'm blessed by God. But I really want you guys to receive a greater blessing. And he literally elevates them in the same way that he elevated Lot. So I don't want you to miss that Abram here, he's not alone. He's not alone. And I think it's so important that when you seek to restore a brother or a sister, 
Sometimes God will tell you to do it alone. Other times he's going to say, listen, first you go and you try to do it by yourself. But if that doesn't work, then what you do is you, you get a brother, you get a sister. And so I think it's so important that, that what we see is this, that when you have this area of oppositions, when you have a brother that's stumbling, that it's important to be able to go and to say, you know what, I need to have assistance. I can't do this alone. And, and what God does is he automatically has people already in Abram's life to come alongside. And this is important. Because as a Christian, we're not all by ourselves, and we shouldn't be all by ourselves. Because what? Iron sharpens iron, and it's important to have the fellowshipping of the brethren. Because if we're all by ourselves, guess what? Everything I think, and everything I learn, and every way that I interpret the scripture, guess what? I'm right! Oh my goodness, am I so smart. I'm so witty, I'm so intelligent. Until what? Until I get around other brothers, and they are used by what? They're used by God to have iron sharpened iron. They say, well, I know you said that, but have you ever thought of this verse along with this verse? And all of a sudden, guess what? Now you're challenged to think. Now you're challenged. You actually have to wrestle with doctrine. You have to wrestle with the word of God rather than just saying, hey, whatever I read is what I read and how I pray is how I pray. But when you have others that you do it, all of a sudden, now you're challenged. And it's important to have those people in your life, not just when it comes to an emergency, try to find some people, but have those people already in your life. And that's a great, great warning for all of us when it comes to the second area of warfare. When it comes to seeing a, a, a brother who's caught up in an area, that, that what do you do when you have a brother that's literally taken by the enemy and taken captive? It's a beautiful picture that when you take a look at the book of Acts, there Peter was arrested. For whatever reason, Herod had got in his mind to arrest James, killed James, and then he decided to arrest Peter. Well, as soon as they realized the church that Peter was in prison, what did they do? Guys, let's have a prayer meeting. They were praying like crazy. Lord, just free Peter. And through that prayer, through that prayer, I don't know how much faith they had, but I do know this. They had enough pray, pr faith to pray. They were praying. And guess what? Chains were broken, were released. Peter was woken up, told to get dressed. Gates were opened up. Peter found himself all the way back at that prayer meeting. That's what prayer does when someone's in bondage, when someone's caught up. And I think it's so important to look to these truths when you come to Scripture. And so Abram has these men here that he's there with already when this guy comes and says, Hey, Abram, there's an issue. Lot's taken. Now, one other point here in verse 13 is this the only place in all the scripture that Abram is called the Hebrew. Abram the Hebrew. Now, the word Hebrew means this. It's either a passenger or a sojourner, just someone who's kind of passing along. And so they, they realize that here, Abram, he's here with us, but he's really not with us. He's passing along, he's hanging out, he's traveling with us, but his mind is set on God. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He's still dwelling in tents, still building altars, still worshiping the Lord. But his friends know this about Abram. But although he's looking for this other city, what? He still is here in the world and he still realizes there's battles that have to be fought. So what we see this, it declares this in verse 13, then the one who escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the tebron trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, the brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. Verse 14, now Abram, when he heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Verse 16, so he brought back all the goods, and he also brought back his brother Lot and his good, as well as the women and the people. And so we see here that what happens to Abram is he now comes in, Abram is amazing because when he hears this, he already has in his, you know, um, possession, 
When Abram heard, verse 14, that his brother was taken captive, and understand, we know it's his nephew, but scripture calls it his brother. He armed his 318 trained servants. These were trained servants. He already did what? He armed them for battle. And I think it's so important. Be ready for warfare, saints. Know this. You have to be ready for battle. I'll tell you what. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities. You have to be ready for battle. But the weapon of our warfare, it's not carnal, but it's mighty in God for the tearing down of strongholds. And we realize that we have a power. And so what Abram does is he's already trained these men for battle. I'll tell you what, you know what I would love? I would love to have 318 trained people who prayed. Oh my goodness, it would fast and pray and go before the Lord. I believe there's not an army that can stand against them. 300, that's all he had. Now understand, these four kings wiped out five kings and all their armies. Abram takes 318 trained servants. He goes, that's it. Now I think it's important to realize that that's all that Abram needs. Why? Keep in mind that when you're battling for the Lord, numbers don't matter. You have to understand that numbers do not matter. In the book of Judges, chapter 6 and chapter 7, you run into this amazing guy that the angel of the Lord calls a mighty man of valor by the name of Gideon. Now, their Gideon, back in Judges chapter 6 and 7, what's absolutely amazing that Gideon... He realizes, I need to go up against these Amalekites. And so he sends out the word and God gives him literally 32,000 men to do battle. Now, the issue is, is these 32,000 men have to do battle against 135,000, which isn't bad. It's a one in four. You think, hey, those odds are good. (laughs) I I think that if, you know, even the army could do that. And so you, you have these guys and you think, one in four, I think we can handle it. And God just says, hey, there's too many. There's just way too many. So if anyone doesn't want to be here, they'd rather be home, send them home. Oh my goodness, did that ever affect the numbers? Drop them down to now the numbers to 10,000. That's all he had was 10,000 men. And so the 10,000 men going up to 135,000 men, that's not bad. That's like one in 13. The Air Force could probably do that. And so when you're looking at that, you're thinking, oh my goodness, here they are. Now there's just only 10,000 and God says, still too many. Still too many. We've got to knock it down where the Marines could take it over. And then so we were, we're looking at this. I'm sorry, I had to throw that in. So, so what happens is this. Eventually, he says, I want you to just take them down to the water. And he says, everyone that, that literally just, just reaches their, their hand up and and puts it to their mouth, they're in one camp, and the other ones that literally put their face in the water, they're in another camp. And it's interesting, I think, I don't know if I said this to the group, but I love this picture because so many people think that it's the people who are there, they're they're, 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 they're looking, and they're aware, and they're watching, and they're, they're putting their hand up, and they're taking it, and they're drinking, and the other people not even looking around, they just put their face in the water, and they drink. And I don't think that's the case. See, I think that the guys that could actually do push-ups and would put their face in the water and things, they put their face in the water, and the guys that couldn't, couldn't do a push-up, I can't bend over. I need a pan of water and drink. Those are the guys I want. I don't want the guys that are muscle bound. I want the guys that, you know, just, he literally wound up with, guess what? 300 guys. 300 guys. Now I'll tell you what, even the Marines couldn't have done that. Even the Marines, as much as I want to boast of them, they couldn't have done that. But I'll tell you what, you don't need numbers when it comes to God. And God used what? He used Gideon, he used these 300 men, and he turned into a mighty, mighty, mighty victory. There's a portion, I want to read it to you in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 14. A beautiful passage, because what happens is this. There's, there's a point where, you know how David, he's the one who says the battle belongs to the Lord. And when he goes up against Goliath. But, but something amazing, his friend, uh, a one that he loved, a brother like his own soul, Jonathan. He was literally the son of the king of Israel, King Saul. 
And Jonathan, just one morning when the, the Israelites were fighting against the Philistines, he just kind of had this crazy idea. So in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I want to start reading in verse... Did you say 14? Yeah. Hang on just a second. Let me see. 1 Samuel chapter 14. And, and so um, that's where I am. I just hit the, hit the wrong reference. So in 1 Samuel chapter 14, let me read to you in verse 6. It declares this. 1 Samuel 14, 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. It's so important to realize that when it comes to the Christian battling, you don't need numbers. You don't need numbers. You just need one person to pray with. And, and ultimately, you just need to just go to God because one in God is still an army. You can realize that. And David realized that, of course, when he went with, you know, the, 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 against the Philistine. And he read, the battle's the Lord's. It's not even mine. And I want you to realize as we're looking how God doesn't need numbers. One other reference, and I want to give it to you. And if you're, if, and I do want you to actually turn there. I want you to turn to the Gospel of John chapter 12. And in the Gospel of John chapter 12, I want to read just a couple of verses to you. I want to start reading in verse 44. And I want to read to the end of the chapter. Because when it comes to how God doesn't need numbers to save, this is a beautiful passage. In John chapter 12, beginning in verse 44, it declares this. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And now look at verse 47. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He came to save the world. This is his work. This is his heart. How does God save the world? One man. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't need numbers. Now, I think it's so important that when it comes to battling, we don't have to have numbers. But what we do have to have is this. We have to have God. We have to have God and we have to be knit to God's heart and to God's will. And so we see here that Jesus said, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me does not receive. He who rejects me does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me gave me a command that I should, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the father told me, so I speak. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He came literally to save the world. And this is where we're looking at when Abram comes with only the 318. Realize, he's, he's got it. He's like, I'm fine. All I need is these 318 guys. Now it's unique what he does to and with these 318 men. It declares this. Now, verse 14. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 servants who were born in his own house and he went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now keep in mind that what Abram has done is he's literally gone the entire length of the Jordan River. He's literally gone all the way up past the Sea of Galilee. He's now up in the very northern tip top of, of Israel there in the area of Dan. And that's where here these four kings have camped out. As he finds himself there, verse 15, he divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. It's interesting that what he does is he divides his servants. And within the Hebrew language, it literally says it's just divided into two. That's where he's divided. It's only into two. And so when Abram comes, he has literally two groups that are fighting. 
There's two basic elements in this warfare that Abram's doing. If you would um, turn to your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 6, it literally tells you about the warfare. It tells you about all those things. And I think it's interesting that when it comes to all this, this warfare that God teaches us, he tells us, of course, in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God. And, and it's interesting that what we see is this, that there is two aspects where the, the, the armor is a defense. And as that armor is a defense, keep in mind that the armor def- protects everything on the front, but it doesn't de- de- defend anything on the back. So you face it head on. But the unique thing is this, with all the armor that you put on, there's two weapons that he gives you, and he divides it into two. And that's found in verse 17 and verse 18. He says this, of course, after he says, take the helmet of salvation, and he says this, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. First weapon that you have, the word of God. The second one, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. It's interesting, there's two weapons that here, as Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, you need to have these two weapons. You have the word of God and you need to have prayer. And it's interesting that what Abram does is he literally did what? Splits his guys, I got two groups. I got two groups. I got one that's the word of God. I got one that's the, the prayer. It's absolutely amazing how when Abram splits it into two and you look to scripture to say, what are the weapons that I use? The word of God and prayer. That's the key. And as we look to these areas, we realize we don't have to have an entire army. What we need is this. We need Christ. And we need that word. There's a beautiful passage, and I want to share with you a battle found in the book of Revelation. If you want to turn there, just turn to the very end of the book. I want to start reading, in first and foremost, in Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. And I want to follow through this because I really want you to see how battles are won on the spiritual plane. In Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, it says this, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, clean and white and clean, Followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now keep in mind that here Jesus comes, and he has this army of saints. These armies of saints are there in white robes, but it's interesting that this army, they're they're sort of like spectators because here he comes on his horse like, yes, here comes our conquering king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's Jesus, our savior. And then in verse 17, I saw an angel standing in, in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Man, now talk about an army. You got kings and captains and horses. You got literally foot soldiers and chariots and, and you know, you've got all these people. You got slaves and free and small and great. And then verse 19, and I saw the beast the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured with the false prophet who worked signs in the presence, in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with flesh. Absolutely amazing. Understand, you don't need a lot of people when you're fighting 
when God's fighting the battles. All you need is the king. Just bring the king, bring his word. You have to understand that his word is living. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And his word will not return void. It is going to go forth and it's going to do that which he's purposed it to do. And we realize this about the king. And so all the king comes on his horse and all the armies follow. And all he does is he speaks his word and they're done. Now what's interesting, when you go to chapter 20, of Revelation, look at verse 7. In time, there's going to be a millennial period where, you know, for a thousand years, Jesus is going to reign. We're going to be reigning with him. And, and so within this point, he's now going to have and allow Satan to be released. And it says this, verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together, to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. So once again, a thousand years later, it's an incredible army that Satan goes into seas while the Lord has this 1,000 years of a reign that he says it's going to be a reign of just what? It's the reign of the law. You will abide by the law. It's a reign of iron. Now notice what happens to this army whose is multiple is the sand of the sea. It says this verse 9. I love how God just makes a mockery of everything the enemy wants to do. They went up on the breadth of the earth. They surrounded the camps of the saints in the beloved city. Fire came down from heaven, from God, and out of heaven and devoured them. <laughs> wow. How anticlimactic was that? They all just said, I'm going to get them. We're just army surrounding the city. And God just, poof, toast. You're toast. That was it. How anticlimactic. Like, we got this army, as many as the sand of the seas. And God says, yeah, that's it. Done. Just fire came down from heaven. It's done. Not an arrow, not a sword, not anything. Understand that when God is fighting the battle, you don't need numbers. And it's so important that when we're looking at, at the world and we're looking at where it's going, we all think, well, we got to get a lot of people together. We got to arm it up. What you need is this. You need someone who's like-minded in prayer. Yes. You need someone who loves the Lord and loves his word and, and is standing in faith. And, and I'll tell you what, it's the people who are with you before the trials start. Yes. The people say, I will join you in this, this desire, this battle to win back a brother who's lost. Mm -hmm. It's so important to have those people in your life. And I'll tell you what, if you don't, you need to find them. And I'll tell you what, if you're looking for one, here's a hint. Look to your right. You're not looking to your right. Look to your right. Look to your left. There they are. Right there. Right next to you. Those are the people to the right and to the left. As far as your eye can see, these are the people. I told you to look to the right. Why are you look, you're looking at me like, really? No, really. So when you're going through this, these are the people that are, are like-minded that are here saying we want to understand how the foundations of the word of God set us up for all the things that the, the enemy wants to throw against us. And so here we see him going. We see him fighting now. We see him dividing his, his train into the two groups. And, and so as we look to this, I love verse 15. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he literally pursues them as far as Hobah. Hobah the, the, is, is a, a city north of Damascus, but its name means hidden. They basically is like, <laughs> they get to the point where, let's hide in rocks, let's hide wherever we can hide. This is where they are. It's this absolute wonderful route that he does. Now, I want you to understand here, the battle that Abram does, he doesn't just say, let's have a victory here and then stop. He said, I want the victory to be total and complete. And so literally, they just rout these guys. So literally, they're up in the north part of Dan. They take them all the way up north of Damascus. And so they, they literally are chasing these guys down. And I think it's so amazing when we look to this, how this is where God tries to get us to have an understanding of just what it is that, that he's trying to teach us that you don't have to have incredible numbers, but you have to have those that are knit, know how to fight, know how to have this, this spiritual 
you know, warfare that they said, I don't mind waging warfare. I don't mind fasting for someone. I don't mind praying for someone. Let's go on this journey and do it. And so we see here, they, they take that whole course of, of the, the length of the Jordan and beyond. They rout this army. And then we see here, verse 16. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. We see here an incredible work that he has done. And so as he now brings back the people, as he brings back you know the, the, the heart, we see here that Lot is in a sense restored. He's brought back. However, keep in mind that as Lot is brought physically back, what we're going to see is this. His heart still isn't brought back. Mm -hmm. So you can bring someone physically back, but if their heart isn't open, if their heart isn't willing to change, if their heart isn't now despising Sodom, because keep in mind that while he was there in Sodom, he moved into Sodom, and because he was there in Sodom, guess what? He was carried away. He, everything he had was carried away. And if it wasn't for Abram coming back and, and fighting this battle, he would have been taken away. And rather than thinking, wow, Sodom's not a good place for me. He still what? His heart is still knit to Sodom. And I want you to understand that when it comes to spiritual warfare, that you can bring someone physically, but you can't change the heart. Only God can change the heart. And so it's important to realize that what we're trying to do is this. We're not trying to get outward righteousness. So often people just want outward righteousness, outward righteousness, outward righteousness, but they really don't care about the heart. What God wants, he, you know, sacrifices. I don't desire, I want the heart. I want the heart. That's what he wants because know this. We all get bummed out when we see what? Dirt on the outside. God says, I want the heart because if I get in you, if I get your heart, guess what? I'll begin to cleanse the outside. But if you just have the outside cleansed, guess what you're going to be? You're going to be the Pharisees. They were, they were whitewashed tombs. The outward was really white and shiny, but the in, in were just dead men's bones. They were literally, they cleaned the outside of the dishes, but the inside was still filthy. And you can't have just an outward form of righteousness. It's so important to what? Deal with the heart. When you're dealing with spiritual battle, it isn't about someone to simply clean the outside. I don't mind someone continuing to struggle as long as what? Their heart is open to the leading of the Spirit. When God convicts them, they're wanting to go and they're wanting to repent. And they're wanting to come back and they're wanting to walk in righteousness. That's the key is the heart. If you're just wanting to change the outward, I'll tell you what, you're not changing a whole lot. It's the heart that God wants. And when he gets the heart, then he begins to cleanse it from the inside. And it takes a while. So you can do an outward cleansing right away. You can say, oh, I'll never do that again. And you don't do that again. But in your heart, guess what? You are still that person. Until you give your heart to Christ, he begins to cleanse it. And so I love the fact that although he brings Lot back physically, we're going to understand what? The real spiritual battle isn't trying to get the outward to change. The real spiritual battle is loving them while the outside is still a mess, but realizing your heart, I want your heart to come close to God. And how does your heart come close to God? Well, the same way that Jesus taught and he prayed there in John chapter 17, that high priestly prayer. He says in that portion, he says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified. Mm -hmm. Jesus sanctifying himself, yes. I'm drawing closer to the Father every single day that you see where I'm going for my help. You see where I'm going for my power. That you too will come to that place. This is the Lord. And if he sanctified himself so that we could be sanctified, how do you sanctify others? How do you deal with their heart? Let your heart draw closer to the Lord. And when your heart is closer to the Lord, you're not worried about the outward. You're worried about what? The inward. Let's just bring our hearts to the Lord and let him deal with what he needs to deal with. And then when we do make mistakes, we'll bring that before the Lord. And it's so important as we're looking to this, now in verse 17, as we realize that he brings back Lot. <laughs> he brings him back physically, but his heart is still lost. And in verse 17, it says this, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava. That is... the King's Valley. Now the Valley of Shava is, is a unique place. If you're familiar with where Israel is, if you're familiar with the Temple Mount is, there's a little valley that's just to the east of it called the Valley of Hebron. 
Um, and, and so you, you or Kidron, you have the, the brook of Kidron that flows through that. That's the Valley of the Kings. This is where literally that, that Abram goes and the king of Sodom goes to meet him in this valley after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who are with him. So Chedorlaomer comes now to, to meet Abram. And it's interesting that what we're seeing is this. When we see that Chedorlaomer, um, when we see the king of Sodom come to meet him, it's implied this, that the king of Sodom actually was one of those who escaped and hid out. That when Abram and everything else of the other kings that didn't get to escape, now the king of Sodom comes to meet him. He comes up and he says, oh, they're coming down. I want to come and meet you and I'll meet you there in the king's valley. So it's understood here that when the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him. So he realized, okay, you, you defeated this. I'm now going to come and I'm going to meet you. So he wasn't with Abram the whole time coming down. All of his people, all the goods, those were all coming back. But here the king of Sodom was hiding out. Now he wants to come and he meets with Abram. Now something unique, in verse 18, it just pops out of nowhere and it says this, Now Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine and he was the priest of the most high God. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, God, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Verse 21, Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abram rich. Here's the third battle. A battle of literally compromise. Because at this point, the king of Sodom says, I want to give you all the goods. And yet Abram literally says, I can't take anything from you. I can't take anything from you. And it's interesting, within this third battle, it's a battle of compromise. Now, if Abraham would, if Abram would have taken all the goods, then eventually what? The king of Sodom could have used this against him. Well, I, the reason you have all that, I gave it to you. you know, I, I gave you everything. I said you could have it. Yeah, I, I lost it all through the five kings, but, but I'm the one that gave it to you. So Abram would be in some way beholden to him in some sense. And just in case that would have happened, Abram says, I will take nothing from you. There's only one person that I will receive anything from, and that's God. And it's interesting that what we see is this, that out of the blue, as, as Abram is about to meet with the king of Sodom, there in the king's valley, there in the valley of Kidron, there's a man by the name of Melchizedek that comes and meets him there. And, and we see here that he's called the king of Salem. Now the king of Salem, in time, Salem will call that Jerusalem. It's, it's the, the early term for that. So he's the king of Salem, the king of Jerusalem. And, and we see this here. He brings out bread and wine. Now, all of a sudden, here's the king of, you know, Melchizedek comes. We know his name. He gives Abram, you know, the, the, the bread and the wine. And he blesses Abram. And then he blesses the God of Abram. And then Abram gives him a tithe of all that he has. Not of all the goods that he got. Just a tithe of everything. A tenth of everything that Abram owns. He gave to Melchizedek. And so we see here that now Melchizedek just disappears. He's here. He's here in chapter 14 and then he's gone and then he's gone and he's gone. He's gone through all the histories until they come to the Psalms. And when you get to the Psalms, eventually you get to Psalm 110. As you get to Psalm 110, all of a sudden in verse 4, David makes this crazy prophecy. He said this, the Lord has sworn, sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So for a thousand years, nobody hears this name. David, just led by the Spirit, writes out this incredible psalm, and it says, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And now all of a sudden, he's not heard for another thousand years. Mm -hmm. Thousand years go by, and eventually, there's another author. 
Another author who's just as mysterious as Melchizedek, the author of the book of Hebrews. And the author of Hebrews does something absolutely incredible. I actually want you to turn there. If you are there in the book of Hebrews, I want you to turn to chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, this beautiful passage is, is opened up. And what we see is this. I want to share with you just a couple of verses before we jump over to um, chapter 7. Back it up. I'm sorry about that. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 is what I'm looking at. So it declares this in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, in other words, God through David, who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, this is God through the Holy Spirit, through David, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now the author of Hebrews quotes, from Psalm 110. Now it's interesting, we're like, who is this Melchizedek? Who is it? Why, why did he pop in? Why did he pop out? What's going on with him? Well, in chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews, let me start reading to you. For this Melchizedek, it says, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. So he's king of Salem, which means king of peace. You know that Shalom, Salem, means king of peace. Priest of the Most High God. Now, this is unique because he literally holds two offices. He holds the office of a king and an office of a priest. Now, now keep in mind that a king was not allowed to hold the office of a priest. Good point. King Uzziah, he went to offer incense. He had leprosy. Bad idea. Well, all of a sudden, Jesus is a unique king, like Melchizedek, that he is both king and priest. Now, or understand that Jesus is not a high priest. He's not the high priest of the order of Levi. Now, Levi is going to be the order of the high priest is going to come what? Through Abraham, and then through his son Isaac, and then through Jacob, and Jacob is going to have the sons, and Levi is going to be one. Levi is going to be the priest, and through Levi is going to be the Levitical priesthood. Through that Levitical priesthood is going to come the priest, come the laws, and they're going to be the ones to intercede, and they're going to be the ones like Melchizedek, who says, blessed be Abram, of the Most High God, and blessed be the Most High God. He literally takes Abraham's hand, and he takes um, you know, God's hand, and he holds them both. That's Jesus Christ. Yeah. He's a God, and he's man, and he holds God's hand, and he holds our hand. And then he does this as we're walking. He just brings them closer and closer and closer, and then he put our hands in the Father. This is what I wanted. Go on. Go, go for it. This is the Lord. And so we see here that what the author of Hebrews does is he says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, which is Melchizedek, and also being king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. So we see here that this Melchizedek doesn't talk about his parents, doesn't talk about genealogy, no mother, no father, nothing like that. And so we see he has no genealogy. And the same thing that we recognize here, because he has no beginning, he has no end. His priesthood is established there in Genesis as eternal. There was no beginning, there was no end. Now the crazy thing is the Levitical priesthood, what? It had a beginning. It had a beginning there when they were traveling through the wilderness. Levi, priest, tabernacle, temple. They had a beginning. And guess what? They also had an end. They had an end when they were all wiped out. And now all of a sudden, the, the, the children of Israel no longer come to God through the Levitical priesthood. Now we come to God through the Melchizedekian priesthood. Why? Because Jesus Christ is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He's not of the Levitical priesthood. And so we see here that all these things that are established in Genesis literally do one thing. It points out that Jesus Christ can be a high priest. Now you say he couldn't be a high priest because what? He wasn't of the tribe of Levi. Wrong priesthood. You're looking at the earthly priesthood that was temporal and the Levitical priesthood was temporal. Look at verse 4 of, of Hebrews chapter 7. It says, Now consider how great this man was, whom even the patriarch Abraham gave an attempt to the spoils. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi, 
who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. Now, what he's saying is this. The Levitical priesthood are literally allowed by law to receive a tithe from the people. And that means what? That as the people are giving tithes to the Levites, the Levites are superior in spirituality, just as far as how God established them. And so keep in mind that because they would bring the tithe to the Levites, the Levites were considered more, you know, higher spiritually. Now verse 6 of Hebrews 7 says this, But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. So in other words, keep in mind that we as parents want to do what? We want to bless our children. Now our children don't really bless us as parents. The, the, he who's the greater blesses the lesser. It's just a spiritual law. And so because Melchizedek blessed Abram, that what? Melchizedek is higher, Abram is lesser. And because Abram now gave the tithe to Melchizedek, it just denotes as what? A position. Melchizedek higher, Abram lower. Now this is what's unique. When verse 7 says, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better, here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. In other words, Melchizedek has never died. He is the eternal priesthood. Even Levi, who receives tithe, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So basically what here the author of Hebrews says, you think the Levitical priesthood is something to do? You think the law is great? No, it's not about the law. It's about a greater priesthood. It's about the priesthood of the Melchizedekian priesthood, the priesthood that Jesus Christ is now the high priest. You are a priest forever, according to this order of Melchizedek, a priesthood that had no beginning, has no end. And because of that, because Abram, and what we see here, the author of Hebrews says that what in Abraham's loin yet to be born was his son Isaac. And in Isaac's loin yet to be born was his son Jacob. And in Jacob's loin yet to be born was Levi. So Levi, in a sense, was paying tithe to this Melchizedek, saying that what? This Melchizedekian priesthood is superior. Now, just in case that was something, keep in mind he's not done. He goes on in verse 11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? He said, man, if the Levitical priesthood was all that and more, why would there be another one? What need is there to have two amazing things? Well, the thing is what? You only need one amazing thing. One was flawed. One was radically flawed. Keep in mind that he goes on to say this. Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. So keep in mind that if we are not under, if Christ is under the Melchizedekian priesthood, then there's a whole nother law that's involved. No longer are we under the law of Moses that from the given by the Levites. Now we're under the law of the Melchizedekian priesthood. Keep in mind, look at what he's saying. Verse 13. 12 again, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated the altar. He says, listen, Jesus Christ, who we're talking about here, didn't belong to Levi. He belonged to Judah, of which no man had ever gone to the altar. No man of Judah could go and become a priest because he wasn't a Levite. Now, he goes on to say, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which the tribe of Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And yet, it is far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to the power of endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Keep in mind that there is the law that was given through Moses. But Jesus Christ said this, a new commandment I give to you. New commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, there's no greater symbol of love 
than Jesus saying this, where Paul said, that which I've received, I've also given to you. On the same night that Jesus was prayed, Jesus, he's, he's, I'm quoting from um, 1 Corinthians 11. But on the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus, he took the bread. And after he had blessed it, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, as often as you do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. As he makes that statement, he says, When you take of the bread, think of me. When you take this cup, think of me. It's a new covenant. It's not a covenant of the law. It's a covenant of love. And he says, I don't want this table to be a covenant of all the things that you failed in the Mosaic law. I want this, 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 this time to be a representation of how much I've loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that one would lay down his life for his friend. You want to know how much Jesus loved you? This much. This much. For those of you that can't see me on tape, I'm putting my hands as wide as they could be, as wide as Jesus had them on the cross. That's how much he loved you. And so he has a new commandment. It isn't about the law. It's about love. It comes right back to the heart of the matter. And I love the fact that it's here. When we take a look back at our passage where Melchizedek comes, look again at verse 18. It says this, that Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Just before the Abram comes and he meets with the king of Sodom. Here this priest comes, this priest that's a representative, he brings out what? These two elements that express love. The love of God for you and the love of God for me. The body and the blood of Christ. He brings out bread and wine. Out of all things he could do, it's like just so happened that while we're here in the Valley of Kidron, that Jesus had crossed over before he went to the Mount of Olives and to say, listen, he sweats it where great drops of blood. Lord, if it was possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he went before the Lord and he went before his father. He surrendered to that will. Why? Love. For the joy that was set before me and during the cross, why? He, because of the love that he had for you and me, the love that he set before us before the foundation of the world. We've been loved and we're still loved. And keep in mind that, you know, the, the worth is literally on the inside. We think the worth is on the outside. What we do and how we do is just, no, the worth is on the inside. Keep in mind, let's just say, and, and this, this, is, this is a far-fetched you know, example, but let's just say that I had $100 and, and I took that $100 and I squished it and I stepped on it and I, I licked it and I put it up my nose. And I said, who wants it? Well, you may say, I, I don't, but a lot of people say, I'll take it. It's still 100 bucks because the worth isn't what's on the outside. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll wipe it on someone else's shirt and I'll, I'll, I'll give it. But it's still what? The worth is what's on the inside. Regardless of how dirty it may look and crumpled up it may be, it's what the worth, the value is set. Do you understand that your worth, your value has been set from the foundation of the world where he set his love upon you? He says, you're mine, you're mine. I'm gonna just do a work in you and through you. And this is the Lord. So this Melchizedek comes, meets in the Valley of Kidron, brings out these two elements of absolute love. And when he does, he does this. He blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the most high God. He calls God the Most High. And I love this because he is the supreme God. He's, he's not a higher power. He's the highest power. And I think, oh my goodness, that the people who are in meetings say, wow, my highest power, Jesus Christ, he's the one that I look to. He's the one that's going to give me any power to overcome anything and break any chains. It's not a higher power. Go to your highest power. And here we see he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of God most high. He said, you are God's. You understand what he did? Abram has kind of been botching it, and now he's, he's there, he's fellowshipping with these three guys, and he says, you're, you're of God. Instantly he says he's of God, and then he allows him to commune with these elements of, of, of literally the, the bread and the wine, and, and so he says, possessor of heaven and earth, this is God, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. It's interesting 
If you take a look at what Hebrew says, beyond contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater, right? We just read that. What does verse 20 say? Blessed be God. Beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Jesus, who being the form of God, who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of what? A man. Coming in this form of a bond servant, he, he humbled himself to the point of death. Absolutely incredible. Now, we don't know who Melchizedek is. He's like the, 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 you know, the, the, the son of God. We, we understand he's like God's boy, but we don't know exactly. Some people say he's Shem. They say Shem was, could have been alive. Others say that you know, he's just a guy that just popped up on the scene. Some people believe that he is the pre-incarnate Christ. They call it a Christophany, an appearance of Christ before the manger. The bottom line is we don't know. And as scripture is silent, we have to be silent. But I can tell you this. That verse 20 gives me pause. Because if the author of Hebrew, who's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the scripture does not lie, if it says beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And then, you know, we see that there, um, where in Paul wrote to the church of Philippi, he said, you know, this is the Lord, who being the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. Puts himself literally, if I lower myself to be equal, it's not a bad thing. You know, I don't consider it robbery. I don't consider it lesser. And so we see here the quality that this priest and king has with God. And so we see here who's delivered your enemy into your hand. And so what Abram does is he gives him a tithe of all. He gives him a tenth of everything that he has. Now, it's interesting that you have to understand that a tithe is not a debt that you owe to God. It just isn't. What, what, it, what a tithe is, is this. It says that everything that I've got, I've gotten from you. And, and what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to literally, I'm going to say that you, you take what you want, you leave what you want. It's all yours. And that's really what a tithe. So keep in mind that the tithe here is before the, the law comes. Now, of course, you know that, that God told the children of Israel to give a tithe so the priests could have you know, their ability to live. And so they could live as well. And, and so you have that being worked out. And Abraham does give a tithe, which is a representation. But keep in mind that here, as Abraham gives of his goods and say, I'm giving this to this priest king. I'm giving it to Melchizedek. All of a sudden, now when the king of Sodom comes, and this is that third battle, once he's been identified with God and he loves God and he, God says, here, Abraham says, everything that I have is yours. Basically, he opened up his hand, a tenth is yours. Now when the king of Sodom comes to Abraham and says, give me all the purses, but take the goods. You have all the stuff. I just want the people. And at this point we see here, take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord God most high. He said, I've worshipped him. I've worshipped him and I will not be beholden to anyone. I'm a worshipper of God. If God gives to me, God gives to me. I, I will not. And it's interesting that here, Abram has a boldness. He has a boldness now in verse 23. He says, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap that I will not take anything that is yours lest you should say I've made Abraham rich. He says, listen, you, you, I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that here's a man being so magnanimous and to be honest with you, I'll tell you how carnal I am. If there was a guy that says, wow, you great victory. We want to honor you with, with saying, hey, you know what? Just you, you brought back all the people and you brought back, keep the stuff. And I was like, oh, God, you're so good to me. You know, you would just give me stuff. And, and yet here, Abram says, this is a hook. This is a catch. Now, how does he know? I believe that he knows. And I believe that it's because what? He's, he's had that intimacy with God. He's come and he's met with this priest king there in the valley of Kidron. And, and he's met where, where, where Jesus crossed over. And he went to the Mount of Olives, and the, the scripture says Jesus is going to come right back over that valley. And it's going to just open right up. He's going to pass right on through and come into his temple. This is the key. You're fellowshipping with God. You're loving God. And all of a sudden, all the things of the world is what? Nothing. <laughs> it's stuff. I don't need stuff. I got God. 
And, and I got intimacy with him. I don't need anything else. The scripture teaches this. We don't need all these other things. Mm-hmm. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. Give us a day our daily bread. That's all I need. I need just enough to just stay focused on you and worship you. This is the heart. And so he does this. And the victory comes. And know this, the victory comes because he's walking with God and worshiping God. But now we come to the fourth battle. And the fourth one is found in verse 24. He says this. At the verse 23, he says, I want nothing of yours except only what the young men have eaten the portion of, of the young men who went with me, Anner, Eshcol, Mamre, let them take their portion. The fourth battle is this, and I find it interesting that Abram doesn't make his form of righteousness mandated on everyone else. And I'll tell you what, that's a hook that the enemy does. You ever notice how someone, when they begin to pray, they try to get you to pray? You gotta pray like this. You gotta pray more hours. You gotta pray all this. Why? Because God has called them to pray and they're being blessed because they're doing what God called them to do, but then they think everybody else has to do it. Or when God calls someone to read the scriptures, and I want you to spend a little bit more time in my word, and they find themselves blessed. And then they try to get you. You gotta do this. You gotta do this. You gotta do this. Why? And it's interesting that what happens is this. When, when God calls you to walk in a very specific way, and you walk in that way, you'll be blessed. Mm -hmm. But if you try to mandate what God calls you to do and mandate others do that, what you've done is this. You've taken your relationship with God and have now made it a religion to other people. Mm -hmm. And that's a hook of the enemy as well. That Abram so wisely says this, God, you called me not to take anything. And he could tell these three guys that were his buddies, don't take anything because he's gonna, you're going to wind up owing him and he's a crook and he's this. Don't take anything. He could have mandated that. But he doesn't. And this is a beautiful walk. And understand that that is a battle. There's a battle that when you start drawing close to the Lord and he starts calling you to walk in holiness and walk in holiness and walk in holiness and walk in holiness. You have this tendency when you see other people not walking. You're not walking. You're not doing it. You're doing it wrong because I'm doing it good and I'm being blessed. Yeah, the reason you're being blessed is why you're walking what God told you to do. But he didn't tell you to tell others what to do. Keep in mind that what this book is, this book that you're holding in your hand is a love letter of God to you. My book is a love letter of God to me. He tells me what's on his heart. He's asking me to walk his will. Now, what he may call you to do is to do something different. Keep in mind that the Lord, he established all kinds of people in this church. He has pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets. He has all different kinds of people. He has deacons and elders and laymen. He uses all kinds of people. Keep in mind that the Spirit has so many beautiful gifts, but guess what? The Spirit gives to each one as He wills, for the duration that He wills, and to the degree that He wills. You can't determine who gets what and why gets what. It's the Spirit of God that does it. Why? Because God knows what He's doing. He orchestrates everything according to His will. We personally see through a glass dimly. We see through a glass darkly. We don't understand what God's doing. And I love this fourth battle. Don't ever forget that what this passage is, it's four battles. The first battle is how the world battles the world. Always try to find something to take it to your advantage, but know this. When you think you're going to use it to your advantage, God's going to turn around and knock you on the head with it. They thought, let's do this in the asphalt pits. They're all covered up. They're all covered with sand. They're going to fall in. Oh yeah, but so will we. Be careful when you battle like the world. Don't try to figure out how you can get advantage over someone. If that's your mind, if you're into a battle, now I'm going to do this. I'm going to one-up on them. I'm going to do this. I'm going to use this to my advantage. Then you are carnal in your thinking. But if you're going to battle, battle in prayer. Battle with the word. Battle like Abraham battled. Divide it into two. Like like Paul said, it's, it's the word of God and it's prayer. That's the, that's the real battle. You, you take it. You don't need numbers. You just need those that are dedicated and willing to fight the spiritual battle. Let those that want to fight, fight with you. 
That's the, the second warfare. And the third is this, be careful of hooks. Be careful of, of, of people coming and saying, I want to be with you and I want to do this. Like, no, you have to understand, I'm with God. I'm with God. If you want to be with God, then, then you're with me. But don't be with me. And I don't want to be with you. I want to be with God. And if you want to be with God, then we're together with God. Yeah. But don't come and be with me. So understand, you know, we're inviting people to say, well, come to the study. Come to the, you know, the upper room. It's an incredible thing. No, come and meet God in this place. Amen. Don't come to the study. Don't come and be a part of us. Come and be a part of God. Yeah. And if you're thinking that, you know, I'm here, I'm a part of this group, understand this group, all that are here, we're a part of God and we're a part of what God is doing. It isn't this group. It's God what's doing what he's doing through his word and in this group. It's him. Yeah. And I think it's so important to realize that that's, that's a hook. It's a hook from the enemy. Don't join with people. Join with God. And if they want to join with God, then you're fine. That's what you want. Let's just come before the Lord and worship him. Let's not have our agenda. Let's look to his agenda. That's what they did in the upper room. They were all in one place in one accord waiting on God to move. And when God moved, all of a sudden, they didn't realize, let's just wait so we can all speak in tongues. They had no clue what was going on. They were just in the room waiting. God's spirit came. God's spirit came upon them. He gave them an utterance. And they were like, wow, what's going on? Let's go out and utter some things. And they went out and they were utterly amazed at what was going on as they were speaking. You knew it was coming. And, and so as they were speaking in the tongues, this was the Lord. This was his heart. And the fourth battle is this. Be careful that when God calls you and he elevates you in holiness, don't mandate people follow you. To the same degree that he calls you to holiness needs to be to the same degree that you give grace upon everyone that he's not called to do what he's called you to do. It's so important because that's the fourth battle. And that's the one, to be honest with you, that a lot of Christians stumble in. Usually what happens is this. We fall in priority from the fourth to the third, to the second, to the first. That's how we fall. But, but it, it's so important that when God calls you to do something that you don't mandate on others. And I love what Abram does here. He says to the king of Sodom, I can't do it, but it's okay for these guys. It's okay for these guys. Let it be our heart to really understand how to battle with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word and your heart and your grace. And Lord, we do pray that this word would be embedded in our hearts and in our souls, that we would take these things and take it to heart, Lord, as you've called us into this place. And we know there are battles to fight. So Father, truly by your goodness and by your grace, show us, teach us, um, Lord, that, that we would be those who just shower grace upon grace. Um, as, as you call us to walk in this way and, and walk in this place and study your word in this way, we're thankful, Lord. Mm -hmm. But let us not mandate this to others. <laughs> let us invite them in. And Lord, we just want to be followers of you. Mm -hmm. So we thank you, Lord, for our high priest, who's according to Melchizedek. We thank you for our Jesus. Mm -hmm. We thank you for his body. We thank you for his blood for that bread and for the cup and those symbols that we can celebrate love. Let us be those, Lord, to walk in those truths. And so, Father, um, we pray tonight that you would knit us to others, that when it comes to spiritual battles, that we would have those kindred spirits to fight with us. Build us up in those ways we ask in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, Amen. Amen.